and, uh, and, and all of those who joined us today and my fellow panelists. Um, we will be talking today about best practices for helping homeowners, renters, and small businesses with Kilauea damage claims. Uh, we are going to be focusing on insurance recovery uh, for those who've had losses uh, from oops, there we go uh, from the uh, recent events uh, on on the Big Island and um, obviously the impact it's had on people on the other islands. Um, so Sergio, as you know, is with the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, um, and United Policyholders has partnered with. The Legal Aid Society of Hawaii after uh, previous disasters, um, so we are very pleased to be doing so again um, today. Uh, I am uh, an attorney. I uh, am the co-founder and the current executive director of United Policyholders. We are a nonprofit that empowers and informs policyholders and advocates for fair insurance practices in all 50 states. We're very active in long-term disaster recovery. Um, we partner all over the country with um, with legal aid chapters, but also uh, with FEMA, with uh, state emergency response officials, and then with local um, officials. So mayors, uh, you know, county commissioners, anyone who is in an area that's been hit by a disaster and has it, and has the understanding that the better uh, people do with their insurance the better able they are to make repairs, rebuild, get back on their financial footing. Uh, we have a nationwide volunteer core of people who have personal uh, and or professional expertise in disaster recovery, insurance claims, and insurance law. And two of our volunteers are with me today on this panel. Uh, one of the most important things I, I uh, always tell uh, good-hearted public interest lawyers, uh, people who want to volunteer their time, uh, or legal aid lawyers who are um, getting involved in insurance matters after disasters is to, uh, this is sort of a play on words, know your limits. And by that I mean the limits of your professional competence, um, your professional um, scope of work, but also um, your the insurance limits, which are um, sort of my way of saying insurance is a very specialized area and kind of, you know, it's, it's great to help people, but it's also great to know um, when you've hit the edges of your of your skill set. Overcoming a claim denial based on a fairly clear exclusion in a policy requires a specialized skill set. Um, so you really do need to seek help from experts. Um, but here uh, you want to, of course, help clients without raising their expectations unreasonably. You know, a lot of people after disasters have. Um, they, this is their first time dealing with anything related to a large insurance claim. You know, most of your clients will have had maybe a auto claim in their day that went pretty well, or they may have had, um, you know, a break-in or something. But when you have major damage to your property from a from a uh, an event like a volcanic explosion, a lava flow, or a fire, or an earthquake. Um, and you're looking to get larger sums of money out of an insurance company on your claim, it's a different ball game. Um, and so, you know, right out of the box, you have to help clients kind of understand a little bit of the lay of the land uh, that, um, that when it comes to seeking a large payout or, you know, payout that is um, above four figures, so, you know, anything above, say, five, $10,000, that um, it's, like I said, it's a little bit of a different kind of um, scenario. Um, and you do need to dot your I's, cross your T's a little bit more in order to get the settlement that you need uh, from the insurance company. Now here uh, on the Big Island, the relatively small number of homes destroyed, um, and again, I know it's relative, it's, it's, it's a lot uh, for the area, but it's relative for insurance companies, can cut both ways in terms of how people are going to come out um, on their claims and how insurers are going to uh, make their decisions. Um, and and uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean uh, about that later. 
So um, one of the ways that United Policyholders can be helpful to, to anybody who's uh, either a legal aid lawyer or, a, um, uh, or somebody who's volunteering their time is, there's, is our website, which is uphelp.org, and then our Ask an Expert forum uh, where individuals can write in and, and ask individual questions. But we have a very, very extensive library that's here for you 24/7 with claim tips. Um, uh, if you are if you are on one of the other islands that got hit by uh, and is encountering flooding from the storms of the last um, month, we have a whole flood insurance library as well. Uh, we've got all kinds of uh, links to sample letters, reports, um, and guidance on resolving disputes and finding expert help. Um, we have sample letters for asking for extensions of time, and again, getting clear answers. Um, many of the legal aid lawyers that we work with in disaster areas um, have gotten a lot of practice in recent years um, on helping clients with things like a FEMA, um, a FEMA claim for individual assistance or, um, or an SBA loan, for example. And one of the ways that legal aid lawyers can be very helpful to disaster survivors is in uh, connection with document reconstructing documents that people have lost. Let's say you know uh, if they've lost their social security number, they've lost their insurance policy. Those are some of the areas where I know legal aid lawyers have had a lot of experience. I think um, on insurance uh, dynamics, it's um, lots. Of, some of your legal aid chapters I know have had lots of experience. Um, and probably um, on Hawaii, that's definitely the case. So some of this stuff is maybe more basic than you need, but I'm gonna, you know, just make sure we cover everything, um, you know, as well as, as we as we need to. We have plenty of time today. Um, so just a few reminders: an insurance policy is a legal contract, as you know, um, but there are laws on how those contracts get interpreted. Uh, we have that principle of contra preferendum, meaning the insurance company wrote the policy, they wrote the contract, um, therefore it's supposed to get, uh, if there's an ambiguity, it's supposed to get interpreted um, not the way the insurance company would say they meant it, but the way that an average person reading it would interpret it. So that's contra preferendum. You interpret it against the drafter because the theory is they had the opportunity to write it. Um, they could have made it as clear as they wanted to. If if they left some things unclear, then it's sort of too bad for them. But because the person who has bought the policy has expectations, and you try to uphold those expectations as much as you can. Um, number two, an insurance claim is a business negotiation, um, and by that I mean yes, it's a contract. It's got four corners, but it's also there is um, there when you're working on getting a fair settlement of a claim. It is a business negotiation. The insurance company makes decisions. They make business decisions. Sometimes they relax their rules, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but where the client has leverage and proof of what they're entitled to, many things are negotiable. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the context of the damage from lava flow, um, and what I mentioned earlier about insurance companies making public relations-based decisions, okay? There's been um, lots said in the newspapers on both sides of, you know, lava flow is never covered versus lava flow is sometimes covered. Um, again, we're looking for the lava flow is sometimes covered. That's when I talk about leverage and PR, that's where we're going here, is trying to get the insurance companies to say, you know what? Um, the insurance uh, consumer is asking for X. Can we go there? Can we get there? Um, even if it's not, even if it requires a little bit of creative thinking. Again, United Policyholders is, uh, we are advocates for the policyholder. Um, so we're here to help anybody who's listening also be an advocate. Um, so, third point clients have paid for coverage and good claim service and should not have to pay for expert reports and legal help to get. A fair settlement. But the reality is, many people do need help getting a fair and full settlement. Um, and that's again why we're here. Key claim tips 
Indemnity, that's a fancy word. In insurance, it just basically means covering the loss. Indemnity in the event of a loss should be effectuated. Again, fancy wording, uh, but the but but you get the idea. Is we want pe we want to try to get coverage for people's losses. That's the point of buying insurance is to get coverage, right? Um, but the truth is, securing coverage for Kilauea damage will require some finesse. Um, insurers have done their best um, in drafting their policies and in um, and, and in creating this marketplace on Hawaii for insurance. Um, they've done their best to carve out coverage for some of the really expensive losses. So they've tried to carve out coverage for earth movement and lava flow. Uh, but coverage arguments can always and should be made where possible, where you have specific policy language that may support coverage, where you have sales promises that can be proven, all right? Um, Kilauea damage may be covered under a home policy. The best scenario is fire. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, in other words, where the damage was caused by fire um, or where there's damage due to power outages um, or power surges or mandatory evacuation orders. Again, these may be bases, solid bases, for you to argue for coverage for a client. Uh, but again, um, some finesse will be required because the insurers have, uh, have been pretty careful over the last couple of decades to try to um, avoid agreeing to pay for, for certain types of damage. Um, here's what insurers have been saying when they're selling coverage. Uh, this comes right off of a website when volcanic eruptions are covered. Um, so if property damage is caused by an eruption's airborne shock wave, ash, dust, or other, other particles, you could be covered. The same goes for any explosions or fires resulting directly from volcanic activity. In addition, home insurance may help cover the costs of initial ash or dust removal from your home's exterior or interior. But here's the kicker, provided it caused damage. Now this is from one insurance company's website. So what they say just goes for them, not every company. Um, and then they went on to say what wouldn't be covered. And this is where you get into the real, uh, the really problematic exclusions. Um, earth movement, landslides, lava flow, mud flow may be expressly excluded in your client's policies. Um, one of the panel members here is going to go into, it, both the panel members are going to go into how you unpack a policy to figure out um, what's covered. But again, the main exclusions you're probably going to see right out there, uh, not, not as ambiguous as I would like <laughs> to be, um, are these exclusions and you're going to see them for flood as well. Um, when, and you're not going to see, my guess, you're not going to see a lot of uh, policies or endorsements covering lava flow expressly because of the area where uh, the worst damage was. Uh, folks there are unlikely to have been able to spend the extra couple thousand bucks a year it costs to get these, these endorsements for lava. Um, remember, when processing a claim, the cause, if the cause of damage is lava, at the end of the day, this is a, an insurance industry spokesperson, if lava came down the hill and they have lava exclusion and trees catch fire, which burn the house, that's not covered. Okay, that is the industry kind of standard position. Well, you can hear already, that's a little different from what I was saying about fire. Um, we're gonna talk about that more as we go through. But fire following, an excluded event. So fire following an earthquake is covered usually. Fire following lava flow could be covered, but again, it's gonna depend on how the policy is written and how Hawaii courts have interpreted these types of disputes in the past, all right? Uh, lava flow may be covered as a fire peril, um, and at one point in Hawaii, um, the commissioner was promoting this position. We give you links to a publication. Um, but then, unfortunately, um, more recently, he, uh, he has been quoted somewhat as backtracking. Um, so I call this sort of a, a smoldering debate. Hawaii commissioner urged some lava claims may be excluded. This was the headline in an, in an article that ran just a, uh, a few weeks ago in an insurance trade journal. 
Um, the next speaker will be talking a little bit of, more about this debate back and forth. Your insurance commissioner is a great guy, but he, you know, it's, this is tough, a tough position. He wants to help consumers get coverage, but he's also got the reality of the marketplace that he regulates. Uh, here is the website for the Hawaii Department of Insurance um, and a link uh, for your, your clients to file complaints or for you to help them file complaints. And our organization strongly encourages um, the filing of complaints because in, uh, that's how the department knows when there are problems in their marketplace. If they don't hear from their, the consumer, they don't know what's going on out there. Um, here's here's a, a complaint form. Um, just a quick recap, and then you're going to be hearing more uh, about Hawaii law from the next two speakers. Um, there are statutory penalties um, available in Hawaii that um, the state can enforce. Um, you have in Hawaii a Uniform Claim Settlement Practices Act that says what insurers can and can't do, best practices for claims handling, uh, the rules about how quickly uh, an adjuster has to come and investigate, how quickly the insurance company needs to make an offer, a settlement offer, pay or deny. Um, there are rules about how the insurance company and the policyholder need to cooperate, how the insurance company needs to communicate, keep their customers informed on the status of their claim, that sort of thing. Um, and then there are statutory penalties for bad faith. And for anybody who doesn't know what that means in the context of insurance, Bad faith is unreasonable conduct. That's really what it is. Is that when you hear people talk about insurance bad faith, that is an insurance company engaging in unreasonable conduct, um, and it can be unreasonable because it violates the law, or it can be unreasonable because it just is not fair on a kind of a on a, on a logic basis. Um, common law bad faith in Hawaii. Um, first party claims against an insurer are recognized as a cause of action. Um, the insurer has to show benefits. There's a typo there. Uh, first party claims against insurer. Uh, the insurer has to show benefits uh, that were due or withheld um, and that the withholding was unreasonable. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of um, nuance here because um, my co-presenter, Kristen, uh, uh, Anders is going to go into that, uh, but but just so that you get have a kind of a general idea, um, an insurance company denying benefits um, isn't isn't going to be considered bad faith um, uh, if they're if they have a reasonable basis um, for their position. If they have the right to make a mistake. The question is, um, was their mistake unreasonable? Um, and, and again, um, there's, it's got to be an unfair dealing, not just a mistake, okay? Um, and there are damages available. And again, this, these rules for the remedies, I want to kind of caution anyone in the legal aid world to know, again, know your limits. Um, you know, you, if there is a, um, an, a policyholder expert specialist out there um, that would take a case on contingency and really knows their stuff, um, you know, somebody from, say, Tristan's firm, um, this is a situation where you want to let things, you know, you want to send these these cases out to uh, the private bar um, that, that if the private bar, if there's somebody qualified the private bar to take it, because you don't want to go outside your, your comfort zone or your um, area of professional responsibility. That said, um, you know, there are a lot, a lot of disputes that you can help resolve as a legal aid lawyer um, that, you know, the private bar wouldn't want, you know, or um, there's no reason to send somebody further. Uh, and again, just to, re just to re recap, um, options for resolving disputes. You always want to go up the chain of command at the insurance company, um, try to get a, a fair settlement for the client, um, help them be effective in their negotiations, um, help them buy, file a complaint if there if there is one, and then of course there's mediation, appraisal, arbitration available for resolving certain types of disputes, and then there's a lawsuit. Um, on our website we have a whole section on dispute resolution. 
uh, best practices for um, post-disaster claim handling in general. Um, and, and I think I want to leave you with a very important point. When it comes to um, helping a client whose property has been physically damaged and whose life or livelihood has been upended, um, interrupted, uh, turned upside down, you know, they've lost the use of their home, um, or they are losing rental value, or um, they need to make repairs. The right experts are critical. And that is, um, when I talk about experts here, I'm really talking about uh, construction. I'm talking about people who understand the physical aspects of what, um, what weather and earth movement and explosions and lava and volcanic eruptions, um, ash, um, sulfur dioxide, what, what those phenomena do to objects. What is their impact on the house? What, what damage do they cause? It's so important to get the right experts to prove the extent and cause of damage, to prove the value, meaning the dollar amount, to discredit experts who may be biased, um, and to disprove allegations of pre-existing damage, which can be very, those are very common where there's a question about earth movement. Um, very common for the insurance company to say, hey, this house was already, the foundation was already damaged, or this house had already moved off its foundation, or there was uh, some other, there was some other problem, you know, chronic flooding or chronic leak or something that, that had already damaged this property. You're going to need the right experts in those situations. So our next speaker um, is, 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 is the perfect segue because he is one of the people that understands um, from a lot of angles the whole um, the whole causation issues. Um, he is an expert. He has his own background um, as uh, as a policyholder that led him to become a public adjuster. He is based in Hawaii. He is a very rare bird. Uh, because he is in Hawaii, he works there, he lives there, he knows um, he knows island life, he's part of it, um, and he is an insurance geek like me. And he is a volunteer uh, with our organization and has been my go-to guy um, on all the islands uh, for tropical storms, hurricanes, uh, flooding, and now um, Kilauea. So Robert Jocelyn, with Hawaii Public Adjusters, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate everybody that's on the line. I'm talking to you from Maui, which is where our main offices are, but we do travel, uh, obviously, to the other islands. We'll be in Oahu later this afternoon, uh, Thursday, probably over in Hilo. We just, we just sort of bounce around. Uh, my background, just real quick, is uh, I suffered a fire April 22nd, 1984 out in our hometown and uh, lost everything and later in life found out that the whole thing was covered. I ended up in Maui just uh, just after uh, that year, uh, 85, and uh, went back into construction, uh, built up a business of building restaurants here and then Hurricane Aniki hit. And during Hurricane Aniki, I met some people called public adjusters and they were doing a Sheraton out in uh, Poipu, and they asked me to help. And from there, I really had my curiosity going. I continued on in my life, but uh, uh, some of the attorneys that came out of Maui that ended up working for Governor Linda Lingle uh, became friends of mine, including J.P. Schmidt, who then became the insurance commissioner. And I'll never forget the moment he said, you know, Robert, what this place needs is somebody like you that can be a public adjuster and an advocate for the policyholders. And that's where I got my start uh, on the full side of this. I brought my construction knowledge. I currently hold 19 different categories of uh, construction trade licenses. I have 19 different ones, uh, which puts me at a great advantage when it comes to talking technicals and construction. Uh, we're full time at this. There's several uh, PAs in our office, all family members. And we're sort of the first family of uh, public adjusters that live here, actually live in Hawaii. We don't travel 
uh, only only to provide expert opinions on things. I'm going to get into the heart and soul of a lot of the policies that are over in that area. HPA, Hawaii, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Hawaii Property Insurance Association was developed as a FAIR Act, which is uh, acronym. And by the way, this, this business is full of acronyms, so you kind of got to get used to it. Uh, they they became the insurer of of uh, last resort standard policies and non standard non admitted. Uh, now now if you have uh, a memory of of the nineteen uh, let's see nineteen ninety one when the lava was flowing over in the uh, summer of uh, uh, ninety one you had. Uh, several of the insurers just bail out of the bail out of the program in what are called zone one and zone twos. So those are qualifying zones that are in additional risk because of lava possibilities of flow lava flow. So HPIA was created a consortium of all all of the uh, PNC the property and casualty people that sold forms uh, insurance contracts. Uh, for for homeowners, which that meant they could get mortgages and they can you know uh, cover their losses, things like that. But it should it ever occur? Well, on the heels of that, Hurricane Aniki does hit, and then the state in March of '92 decided, well, we're going to make HPIA able to sell policies everywhere. So a lot of the a lot of the windstorm activities and things uh, that that were associated with Aniki became available to everybody else. That made the reinsurers all come back into Hawaii and able to make this a very competitive, viable uh, market. So that's some of the history that gets us up to why we have uh, lava issues right now, is it really tracks out of the summer of 91. Oh, I'm looking to see how I, there we go. All right, so there's sort of what we were talking about. Um, uh, so to get a policy from HPIA, it's a it's a, it's a two we call it a two bump and then app, meaning you got to get declined by two two carriers to be able to then file an app for HPIA. You can't just go over to HPIA and say I want insurance. You have to be told no twice, and then you're open to have an app. <coughs> those those rates are a bit higher with a bit less coverages. You've heard of replacement uh, policies, or, or oh, I'm sorry, you've heard of all risk, right? Which is not necessarily true. It's a that's a bad definition. You should never believe that something is an all risk. And somebody's like, I got an all risk. What it is is we sure against everything, eh, except for this, 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 and this. But we sure against everything, except for this, this, and this. However, if this happens, we'll give it back to you. So, HPIA uh, does not have um, replacement. They have uh, Actual cash value uh, policies, which was the ones that preceded, uh, I'm going to say, the early 50s when uh, the GI Bill came in. A lot of the mortgage companies did not want to have to, you know, have somebody's house burn down. And say, okay, well, here's how much money you got. They said, no, we want you to insure the whole thing. So the depreciation methods were used to get you back up to the zero sum loss game uh, that was not available uh, back over two times. So. Uh, let's see. Next. Uh... Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is uh, the HPA board is an eight-four member blend. Eight people from the industry, being one of those uh, carriers, PNC carriers, and four members from the public. They decide sort of the the way that the whale moves, uh, ever so slowly. Okay, all, all real estate policies are either, which is in the HPIA network. And again, this is because we're in zone one and zone two areas over there on the big island. You're going to see HPAI, HPIA policies, which are either going to be DPs, which are drawing policies, or HO2s, which are homeowner two policies. Both of these are broads. Back that up. You have a basic policy, right, which is an HO1. 
You have an HO2, which is a broad policy, covers more perils than the basic policy. And then you have the HO3, which is the quote unquote, all perils, but not really. So you're dealing with uh, the DPs and HO2s on a broad base policy, which is a named peril policy. Both are sold with lava and non-lava coverage. Uh, these these um, can be sold to you either way. And, and why is that important? Well, if I'm in Kauai and I can't get an insurance policy because my house is on the water and I got two people saying, no, we want you to do this, no, we want you to do that, you can then go to the HPIA and go get a non-lava coverage for Kauai for your beach home and then try and add a hurricane to it. So there's these different steps that the underwriters go through when they get a, when they get a double bump, but an app that comes in. You gotta fill all this information out. But the point of making it lava, non-lava was now, it didn't matter that you were getting lava coverage. You were forced to get lava coverage if you were trying to get it someplace. Now, you, now the choice is there based upon the underwriter's risk evaluation. Next slide. Sorry, hold on. Okay, now let's drill it down another step. Dwelling policies are secondary vacation home type of policies. HO2s are the most prevalent amongst those HPA policyholders and which are sold by producers. Producers like selling that because it's really, these are owner occupied homes, right? HO, homeowners, or DPs or dwelling properties. So if I got my vacation home, uh, or you know, I've got part of it, if I got three houses, I can only cover two, I will add a DP policy because it's a rental. Uh, or I am uh, I am in a place where uh, I I have a piece of property. Joey lives in Oregon and he wants to uh, use it as a rental out there, or he wants to use it as an um, uh, Airbnb or any of those things. A DP covers that. So if we drill that down again. Both policies, Section One, which is your property coverages, ranges are A, which is your dwelling. The range bottom is 50, high is 350. B is 10% of A. Now, B is your other structures, your farm, your, your detached garage, your, your uh, storage buildings, your shed. Those are all of your others. So most of your policies, when you get to them, I'm sure Tristan and his other section will go through this. You have, if I have a $300,000 A, which is my dwelling, and I have my 10%, so my garage, detached shed, and barn, have all got, you know, are, are covered for $30,000. Can't go any higher with this. Um, so, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, did you say that 350000 is the cap? Is that the max? That's the max, just like your flood is 250 capped. Right, okay. So on the left is the HO2. Now we break apart. HO2C is your personal property. Personal property is, is not your real property. It's your, you know, your your, uh, your bookcase, your couch. I'm sure everybody understands what contents are. And the best way for you to understand what contents are, if I take that house and I turn it upside down, everything that falls out, that's contents. Everything that's glued, glued or screwed is not a content. So just use that as a picture. HO2 is 50% of A. So if I have 300,000, I have $150,000 coverage on, on the uh, personal property. But on the DP side, my rental, my vacation home away, is a is ten thousand to twenty five thousand. It is not a percentage; it's a fixed amount. So why would you want to have that if you're renting it out? Well, if I turn that house upside down, I'm going to have the window unit fall out. I'm going to have the refrigerator. I'm going to have the stove. I'm going to have the things that I have in there as personal property within that rental are things that needed to be covered, but they're not really the rest of the place, furnished or not, right? So it allows you, if you've got some basic furniture, up to 25000 It's not a percentage of A. Now, the last uh, D coverage is, is broken up separately also. D, loss of use. That means if a peril insured against creates a loss that makes that uninhabitable, that house is uninhabitable for whatever reason. The kitchens, the bathrooms are out, the septic's bad. You get 20% of A to go live in, in a place that is of like kind and quality for what you're leaving. So if I had a two bedroom, two bath on the water, I can go find me a two bedroom, two bath on the water 
doesn't matter what I was paying for a mortgage, doesn't matter what it's renting for, it just goes for the value for what that is as a, as a like for like replacement. 20% of A. These are all, these are not part of, these are the limits under each of those coverages. It doesn't, I have some people get this mixed up by saying, well, I have a $350,000 policy and I got this, this, and this. I said, well, no, wait a minute, you've got more than that. If I start adding the 50% of that and the 20% of that, you're getting up to, you know, 600,000. So you know, understand that these are all separate called out policy limits under each one of these sections that don't total up to what the A is. They total up to be this, this final number. And we'll talk about these additional coverages. Over on the DP side is your farm, uh, your vacation secondary. Uh, you can see that FRV is your, is your uh, fair rental value or the, the uh, additional living expense, which is 10% of it. You see that's lower. So if I have a, if I have a $300,000 A, I have 10% of that can go to either uh, fair rental value or additional living expenses if I'm putting somebody up. Different than D. All right, so let's run a comparative of how these policies actually uh, work. The DP, it has a simple definition, simple paragraph says, you, yours, and we, us, and ours. They don't go too much further than that. That, that to me is always better. And when I see small definitions in policy uh, section ones, uh, it works in the favor of a policyholder. Because if you go to the HO2, the larger uh, homeowner policy, it's an entire page with eight headings that then breaks up other definitions. So the more defined it is, uh, the more <laughs> lessens the wiggle room. But then again, it also it also makes it so that they're defining it so if what you think it is isn't in there, it's not defined, it's, it's ambiguous, which, of course, goes to the policyholder. Again, DPs are meant for secondary rental properties, so there are small PPs, small personal property coverages, and smaller AL, uh, additional living expense coverages. HO2s are meant for their primary owner-occupied property and afford the greater limits of those uh, uh, C and D coverages and better general liability coverages. Now, I have never understood that one because I would think if I got a rental out there and I'm not even on the island, I, I'd want to increase that general liability because goofy things happen in rent houses. Next is the PP. This is an HO4. Uh, that is for personal property only. So why would you want only my personal property? Well, if I'm the renter of one of these houses and I have a policy that covers my nice book collection and a bunch of other things that are in that house, I'd want to, I want to make sure that my PP, I have a, I have a renter's policy. And the UOs are the unit owners. Those are the HO6s and they're generally known as the condo owner policies. They have coverages A, C, and D. And you're going to go, well, why don't I have a B? Well, because when you're a unit owner, you don't own a garage sitting there detached. You don't own a shed, the horse stable. You don't have that. So that, that coverage is not necessarily, and for good cause, it's not in the policy. Drilling it down again. Here is the language out of the coverage A dwellings for the DP. Dwelling is the resident premise shown on the declarations. Materials and supplies located on or next to the resident premise. Now, why is that important? Well, because you know, if if you if I have the fence and a few other things that are attached to that, uh, it starts becoming uh, is that covered? Is that not covered? If I have uh, uh, stuff that is that is attached in an outside shed, attached is important. Then those materials that may be in there for when I go and work on that house, they're all covered. DPs work that way. HO2s, same language, same language, but then it as it as a third building equipment and outdoor equipment used for the service of and located on the described location. Well, why does that matter? Well, because if I have a house that's mine and I got a pool, and I got pool equipment, I've got things like that that are outside beyond, that pool equipment would be covered because it's servicing the described location. So that is added as a tag. All right, now 
Coverage B, other structures. Now, again, that's what we, we went over this. We do not cover other structures on the DP. Uh, all of them have their, the, same, uh, the, uh, the, same, the same lead in tagline. We cover other structures on the scrap, okay, yada, yada, yada. This includes structures connected by only a fence, utility line, or similar connection. Now, why do they say that? Because if I have, a, if I have what I think is an attached garage because a fence or utilities or something else is there, they're going to say, no, 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 you need to have a B a coverage under this. And it's very important because there's been a lot of case law about a breezeway or a canopy, you know, connected. And so in this, in this situation, they want that to be a, a structural attachment that makes that all under the A coverage. Why is that important again? Because A has got the large coverage, B is 10% of that. So a sprawling garage detached is still only going to get 10% of the whole house. Can't, can't go over it. So we do not cover other structures used in whole or in part for commercial manufacturing or farming. Huh, okay. Rented or held for rental to any person not a tenant. Now, I like that because if it is rented or held as a, as a rental for, for a tenant, then it is covered. We do not cover it. And under the HO2, uh, and this is, I've never understood it because between DPs and HO2, is this used whole or in part for businesses or, and you notice that businesses in quotes, what does that tell you in an insurance policy? Anything in quotes that you see takes you back to the definitions page to say, what are they calling a business? And they define it. So anytime in a policy where you see these quotation marks, it's defined, go to the front of section one. Don't, don't let your mind decide what a business is. Go to what they tell you a business is. And if it's outside, what's going on there is outside of what they define a business as, chances are you can get coverage. And then the same thing, rented or held for rental to any person, not a tenant. All right, clause of language here. Coverage C, personal property. All, PP is all you see, it's all time, personal property. A real scholar's of contents, but they call it personal property to distinguish anything not being real property. We, co we, we cover the property owned or used, owned or used by an insured. <laughs> Anywhere in the world, and most policies will read anywhere in the world, meaning your coverage sitting in Cabo in a timeshare uh, gets stolen, you're covered over there. At your request, we will cover personal property owned by others while the property is on the part of the residential premises occupied by the insured. So, you know, somebody takes their bicycle and sticks it inside your house and it gets stolen, you can say, I want that covered under my homeowner's policy. A guest or a resident, residence employee, while the property is in any residence occupied by an insured. What does that mean? It means you're made. It means your caretaker. It means those people's property can be, can be at your request of policyholder covered. All right, now... Now, like we say, they give you coverage, and then they take it away. Here's both DPHO2s have 10 additional personal property clauses that subject certain losses, money, watercraft, jewelry, firearms, there's 10 of them, 10, that lower sublimit. So if I have that jewelry collection that's like, oh, my gosh, I have $10,000 in jewelry, well, they're going to find there's a sublimit of $2,500 under DP. So you've self-insured $7,500 worth because you didn't have coverage for it, and they're going to pay you $2,500 for it. Now, there are several personal properties that you could turn the house upside down and they'll fall out, but they're not covered either. Your animals. If I turn my garage upside down and my car falls out of it, well, that's, that's the content, right? No, because under the exclusions, it is subject to a registration by a government authority. I turn it upside down, an airplane falls out. It's not covered. Business data, that's your servers and things, and your hard copy stuff. So anyway, they take it, then they reduce it, and some of it they say not at all. And these are all spelled out fairly commonly known to all of us in the industry. Am I talking too slow? No. Okay. Doing great. Am I putting everybody to sleep? <laughs> all right. All right, now here's where we're going to get into the lava side of things. Coverage D, fair rental value. Now, 
If a loss to property described in coverage A, B, or C by a peril insured against, a peril insured against, we cover its fair rental value, meaning the fair rental value of that part of the described location rented to others or held for rental for you by you unless any expenses that do not continue, less any expenses that do not continue while that part of the described location rented or held for rental is not fit to leave to live in. Now, I call that out as held for rental. Many of the claims I handle, it's a rental, but nobody's in it. And the very first thing an adjuster wants to say is, hey, you guys didn't have anybody. And that's, I said, hey, that was up for rental. Here's an old lease. Here's play, you know, and I will I win it every time. I said, I do not have to have somebody in that house, but if it's a if it's a if it's held out for rental, they owe, and what do they owe? The fair rental value. If I say Two years ago, they had it for $1,000 out there a month. And they say, well, okay, where's well, 1000 No, no, no. Right now, it's going for 1400 That's the fair rental value. We go online. We go to the Craigslist, uh, some of the Airbnbs. We will set what the rental value is, and I've, we've never lost this, not once, because the fair rental value has got nothing to do with any existing or prior leases. Set the fair mm -hmm. rental value. Of course, it works the other way. If the market takes a dive on us out here, it could go the other way. It's whatever the fair rental value is. Now, under the DP, separately calls out coverage E. We were just talking about the coverage D. Now, coverage E is additional living expense. Same language on coverage. It's by a peril insured against. We cover its additional living expense, meaning any necessary increase in living expenses incurred by you so that your household can maintain its normal standard of living. We have a person over in Hawaii, Kai, an elderly lady who has two dogs and a mother that is in a wheelchair. This Hawaii Kai house has a very large $5 million valuation. The insurer said, that's just too much. You, you, you just put her in a hotel. I said, no, I'm going to find her a Hawaii Kai house with a pool that will take two dogs and is ADA approved. I found one, $6,000 a month. They have to pay it. Okay, now HO2D, in other words, the DP, the DP and the DP are combined under HO2D as a loss of use. And it says that the coverage has both FRV and ALE covered in it, but it's a greater amount. Very important. Here's the first thing about coverages. Go look under your ALE and your coverage D&Es under the DPs, and you will find this line. If a civil authority prohibits you from use of the, of the I, I don't get into a long period, I'm trying to get right to the nuts of it, premise, as a result of a direct damage to a neighboring premise, we cover the additional living expense for no more than two weeks. So what does that mean? Civil authority. They come out there and the mayor says, hey, a proclamation, you guys got to get out of there. We won't let you go back, but you got to get out and you're out for two weeks. That's covered because your peril, we're going to get to that, is a covered loss. And the civil authority said, "Those are, you know, it's in this neighborhood. We just want to clear that neighborhood out. You got a claim right there. You have an ALE, additional living expense claim. Thanks, Frank. Amy. What? <laughs> did you, it, did, is, can you not see it move to debris removal? Uh, there we go. Did it just flip? Sorry, there was a delay here. All right. So some additional coverages. Now these these are coverages that they'll they don't tell people about because you got A, B, C, and D, right? You got that, and then down further in, further down several pages back, they'll say something called <laughs> additional. <laughs> Additional coverages. First is debris removal. This is, this is right out of the uh, language of the policy of DPs and the HO2s. Debris of covered property if a peril insured against. All right, well, of course, let's see. We're going to get to what assured against. That applies. Or ash, dust, or particles from a volcanic eruption that has caused direct loss to a building or property contained in a building. Ash, dust, or particles from a volcanic eruption. 
We're obviously going through a volcanic eruption. We also have acidic rain falling over there. That's damages, folks. If I if that house is open and that ash went in there, I will tell you, you've got everything that's a, what we call a soft product. <clears throat> Think curtains, blinds, cushions, couches, rugs, all that stuff. Acidic airborne stuff is not it's not good for that stuff. How are you gonna how are you gonna indemnify them, make them back to them? Well, we're gonna get out here, we're gonna, we're gonna get a carpet cleaner. I said, okay, let's just test it. Sure, no, are you a little test? And it's like, no, all these soft products are gone. So they'll say, well, we want to test it. It's like, hey, just remember this this is a this is a homeowner's claim. This isn't the insurance company's claim. That's why it's called a claim. It's a it's a it's I'm making this claim for these damages. They're there to say, no, we have the right to repair or replace. And then they're gonna do everything to try and just repair it. And if it's not correct, they pay for the attempt to repair it and the replacement too. Never fall in the trap of saying, sure, let's see. But right now the claim is to replace it. We are making a replacement claim. You're going to try and test something. We got that. We're not gonna pay to have it tested. Half the time they just give up. They say, okay, we're not gonna go through this. All right, trees, shrubs, and other plants. Well, we cover trees, shrubs, plants, or lawns. And I'll tell you right now, how many, how much times do we see on the TV those trees are fire on fire, the lawns, all these other things that that are may not have burnt the house down yet, but they're damaged. Well, because the following perils insured against starts off by saying fire. It'll say smoke and other things down the line, but fire is important because smoke, smoke just runs with fire. We will pay 5% of the limit of liability that applies to the dwelling. In other words, here's where they're going to give you. If you got that $300,000 uh, limit, they're giving you another 5% on top of that. They're giving me $15,000 to do what? Well, to replace those plants, that tree, that bush, that lawn. That's right. There it is right there. This is additional coverage, additional insurance. Next slide. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Reasonable repairs. We've had several claims where uh, it's it's kind of funny. You get a contractor and he's like, I know how to do this. I'll just do the whole, I'm just going to redo this whole house now. And I'm going to do, I'll just give him the bill. I said, well, good luck on that. Cause uh, I've never seen it work that way. <laughs> In the event that a covered property is damaged by an applicable peril insured against, say, a fire or ash or whatever, we will pay your reasonable costs incurred by you to necessary repairs measures taken solely to protect against further damage. And what does that mean? Let's say that I got a partial house fire. You've seen some of these houses are half burnt. You see some of them have gotten, you know, falling rocks on them. Cover it, right? You're, what you're trying to do is mitigate additional damages. Well, I, I have a whole new. Well, now you got a thunderstorm putting water in that house. You, you're, you need to show that you have the good faith and, and the, <laughs> the wherewithal to go tarp that thing, cover that. Uh, it's not that you have a, a liability problem if you don't. It's that, that you got to mitigate your loss. It's only fair to the insurance company. And that's what they're also they want to they want to tell you. You can't abandon it for them to go. You, you've got to you got to do some kind of an effort for which they'll reimburse. It's, um, you know, I can't think of how many hurricane places you see where you look out or you're flying in or, and you see all the blue tarps, all that tarp work, you can, contractors go door to door, what do we call stormtroopers, and they will knock on everybody's door. I think you need a tarp. I think you need a tarp. And they will blue tarp a community with these contracts go around. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's actually saving you the heartache of, uh, and, and the safety of trying to climb on your own roof and, and attempt to mitigate your loss. So, um, this is this is the clause that gives you that additional um, <clears throat> go for it kind of a call. Um, so next is property removed. We ensure covered property against direct loss from any cause while being removed from the premise endangered by a peril insured against. There it goes. And for no more than 30 days while removed. So I've got uh, fire, smoke, lava, something coming at me, and if it's a if it's a peril insured against. Well, they're going to pay for that move and for that storage and for the, you know, whatever, whatever it takes for you to, because what are you doing? You're helping them not pay for, for the total loss of, of these things, right? You're, 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 you're putting your best foot forward, 
you're going to go over there and, and get somebody to help you move. Get a moving company. I mean, you know, they'll they'll move, they'll clean your whole house out, move it. But you got it for 30 days. You got to move it back in. They'll pay for that if 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 it's going to be a well. In other words, <laughs> if you got something coming at you, get out of the way, right? The get out of the way is we'll get your personal property, get that stuff out of the way way ahead of time. Don't wait for the evacuation order because you're essentially throwing what you can in your car. Hopefully, you take your pictures in your and your you know the, the important documents and uh, skedaddle. This is the one that gives you the. I think we better move here now. This getting too close without waiting for some evacuation order. Next slide. All right, now here's, here's where the language is you're looking for. Perils insured against. I see that's all throughout both the, T, the DPs and HO2s. We insure for direct physical loss to the property covered, covered caused by, and it's these, one, two, three, six, seven, nine, there's nine items, unless the loss is excluded in the general exclusions. So here's where they give you the coverage, and later they'll try and take some of it away. But right now, it's fire, all right? Down below at seven, you'll see it's smoke. And, and, and see, when you only see the word meeting, that's not in the description smoke, but over here it is. So you're finding definitions when they say meaning. Sudden and accidental damage from smoke. Well, all that smoke, all that's covered. This apparel does not include loss caused by smoke. Anything that they're not going to cover smoke is right here. Does not include loss caused by smoke from agricultural smoke or industrial operations. Right? So that smudge, of course. <laughs> sirens going on. There we go. Sorry. Uh, this peril does not include. Anyway, so smudge, agricultural smudge is cane burning, that kind of stuff that everybody was going on about. So, okay, sorry. Next. Uh, no, no, I. I ahead of you that's okay all right now we're talking about uh, uh, what's also insured against perils insured against falling objects excluded they they exclude that unless the falling object damages the roof or an outside wall of the building is first damaged by a falling object so in other words a falling object can't be inside your house so you see how the dip, they're not telling you that's what they mean but uh, if you have a falling object inside your house, well, that's not what they mean. What they're meaning is something coming from the air onto it, like a rock being thrown up by, a, you know, an eruption, uh, or being cast out of something. Or if that that falling rock is an air is an air product coming down <clears throat> in your house, your roof, uh, walls. That's covered. Move on down. Go ahead. Okay, so we. I'm sorry, Robert. So a tree, uh, a tree that falls um, would be covered here under this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Next slide, or? Uh, no, no. I'm going to look at 14, everybody, please. Here's where. No, no, okay. 14. Volcanic eruption. So this is this is other than loss caused by earthquake and land. So so. <laughs> If you see, they're telling you volcanic eruption other than loss caused by earthquake land shock waves. You don't see lava. They're talking about the movement of earth shocking earthquakes. They're not talking about others. Additionally, now HO2 has two others that they add. Freezing. Yeah, that's going to happen. Sudden accidental damage from artificially generated electrical current. What is that? That's a generator. People have hooked up generators to the house because they lost power. And they fry every electronics into place. So they're saying, okay, we'll we'll cover that because you're trying to get your power up. So so oh. that is that is on your own personal grid. That's not coming from off the grid. Next slide. Here's the exclusions. Ordinance and law. We'll talk about that. Uh, We'll talk about that a little bit later. Earth movement, meaning, and here's the meaning word. Look for that meaning word. That means it's a definition. It is earthquake, including land shock waves or tremors before, during, or after a volcanic eruption, landslides, mine subsidence, mud flow, earth sinking, rising, or shifting, unless direct loss by these. A fire, earth movement, 
with a fire, that's covered. Explosions, the Puna plant could go, right? The sand's not covered. Break the glass, oh no, it's not covered. And then it gives it back to you. They'll cover, ensues, and then we'll pay for the ensuing loss. Meaning, not the breaking of the glass, but whatever that glass broke caused. In other words, not from the fire, uh, not from the earth movement, but from the fire, the ensuing. And that's very important because ensuing losses, anytime you see that, they were giving you that coverage back under that condition. Three, water damage, meaning, and there's uh, all these triple dots, meaning there's another thing that, that wouldn't apply to these in this particular loss. Power failures, right? We're going we're gonna to exclude power failures. But if a peril insured against ensues, we will pay only for the ensuing loss. Well, power failure is important because, you know, I know people have got $3,000 worth of meat in their freezers and things like that. I know some people that lose electronics over some of those things. So those are covered as ensuing losses, but not the power failure in and of itself. Where do you go with that? You go back to the power company because they have insurance for that. And then you got the last eight. You got neglect, war, nuclear hazard, and intentional loss. Obviously, if you burn your house down on purpose, they're going to pay for it. Very important. Earth movement does not mean lava or magma under the DPHO2 policies. It's not in the language there. So, so that's that's how you walk through a policy from beginning, and you just keep drilling it down to find out if you've got that coverage or not. And that's my there is my this is my lava smoke fire speech to everybody. So thank you for listening. Um, just a quick question, Robert, before we um, move on to Tristan. Um, the I've been hearing um, some buzz about insurers using the pollution exclusion to as as the uh, justification for denying some claims um, from the uh, about the sulfur dioxide. Is that is that a uh, an issue that that people have been coming to you for help with? No, oh, because uh, no, I, I've got I had one person actually. I said uh, you're going to find the exclusion says industrial. That is not industrial. I mean, it could be created industrial, but it's not. This is this okay. is of the earth. This is of the earth. And I've had somebody. Well, why don't we just go over there and just put the lava out with water and, the, and all those helicopters? And I'm going, geez, you're not trying to put out a fire. You're trying to put out the earth. What are you thinking? You know? <laughs> all right. Well, great. Um, uh, I think uh, if we have time, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to get some questions. So I'm going to move on to Tristan Andres, um, who's an attorney with the Hawaii-based firm of Dealey King, Pang, and Van Etten. Um, I know them as a policyholder-focused law firm. Uh, they also have done some volunteer work with our organization and our sponsors. Um, uh, Alan Van Etten, who's Tristan's uh, partner, is a uh, likes to help us with our amicus briefs that we file, friend of the court briefs, uh, to try to keep the law uh, strong to protect policyholders' reasonable expectations. So thank you, Tristan, for being with us today. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to everyone for participating and you know volunteering to go out there and, and fight the good fight and help out people in this time of loss. Um, it's one of the things that I like about my job is that I do feel good at the end of the day, you know, helping people kind of navigate this and help out with the what often can be David versus Goliath with the homeowner versus the you know massive insurance company. So some of what I'm going to talk about may be a little bit redundant to what Robert said, but I think we're going to we're coming at it from two different angles, um, so it will be helpful. The main purpose of what I'm saying or talking about is how to navigate a policy, the main parts that you want to focus on, because uh, I believe at this stage with the people that are coming in, it's really going to be looking at the policy, deciding the you know the necessary follow up and and where they can go moving forward. So, of course, the entire policy is important, but there's these six sections that I've identified. Robert actually introduced me to the uh, acronym DICE, or Declarations, Insuring Agreement, Conditions, I think endorsements. Um, but these are the main areas that you want to focus on. So, 
as you're getting into the policy, generally what happens when someone comes to us with a insurance coverage dispute or comes to us and says, you know, can you take a look at this and see what to do? They'll have their story. That's obviously the facts. And then they'll have the policy, which Amy said is, is the contract that really controls the scope of coverage, et cetera. So obviously the policy is very important, um, but these things can show up in any order. There's not really like a set policy because it depends on the insurance company and the way they organize things. So these may be in different areas. They may or may not have headings, although they usually do, uh, but you just want to make sure to key in on these areas. I think the other thing that's important to, to keep in mind is that a lot of, of the analysis kind of depends on where the, uh, where the insured is in the process. So if someone comes to you and just says, my, you know, I just suffered this, suffered this tremendous loss in my house, they may not have even called the insurance company yet. They may just not have any idea how to handle it. And so you really have to kind of determine, are we just at the very beginning where we need to you know, notify the insurance company? Do they have their policy? Do they not have their policy? Um, or have they already received a denial letter? So it sounds like this has been going on, you know, for me watching the news for about a month or so. So some of these claims may not even have been made yet. So you really want to find out where they are and then kind of assess what the next step is. So the first part that you're going to look at is the declarations page. That actually usually is at the beginning. Um, it sets forth those details there, the name of the insured, the address of the premises, policy period. Um, again, when you have someone coming in for the first time often, um, of course, they're going to be traumatized and you know, a lot of people have never been through anything like this. So they may just come to you with nothing or just the declarations page. They may come to you with the wrong policy. They may be grandson helping out auntie or grandma. So you kind of just need to assess that and see what information do I need to have them gather um, so I can you know, help them move forward in the process. So we do have situations where somebody will just come with a declarations page and you know, obviously we need the entire policy to determine you know, what's covered, what we're dealing with and what the next steps will be. I think one of the important ones here is the policy period because they may not have the current policy and that's the one that you're gonna to need to make the claim under. So on the next slide, there's an example of a declarations page from a policy. Um, I'm not sure that you can see that, but it does have the information I just described. It'll have the limits that, um, that Robert discussed, those range of, of limits for the premises, et cetera. And then on this one, you can see that there's also a schedule of endorsements, which we'll get to later, which are kind of like addenda that will um, modify coverage. After the declarations page, where I go to is the insuring agreement. And this really sets forth the scope of what's covered. Uh, Robert talked about that, the different coverages that there are under the policy, uh, you know, the property, personal property, et cetera. Um, when this, if, if a case happens to move forward and go into litigation or just go to kind of a more of a full-blown coverage dispute with the insurer, the burden is on the insured to prove that there's a peril that's covered under the insuring agreement. So this is kind of like the initial step where you say, did a loss happen that's covered under the insuring agreement? So on the next slide, this is an actual policy, uh, you know, cut out from a policy that has three of the coverages that Robert described, coverage A, coverage B, coverage C. It says coverage is there. Um, sometimes it would say insuring agreement, uh, but this is what it will look like for this particular policy. But every policy, like I said, is different. It just depends on the insurer. But you're looking for this kind of coverage A, coverage B, and that's something that says this is what this insurance policy covers. On the next slide, you have a, another example of the insuring agreement, again, A, B, C on this page, just showing you that they look, you know, they, they can and do look different. So you just want to make sure you get to the right uh, section to kind of launch the initial analysis. And then on the next slide, uh, this is what Robert was just talking about. In addition to that kind of general insuring agreement, then there's these perils that are insured against. And on this particular policy, it's number 16. 
that covers volcanic eruption other than loss caused by earthquake, land shock waves, or tremors. So a lot of the dispute in these kinds of losses will be how does the insurance company categorize the loss and you know what are the facts? Do the facts match with how they're categorizing it or are the facts different? Um, one of the things that always kind of, I don't want to say irritates, but one of the things that I find very interesting, I guess, about insurance is that the entire system is inherently a conflict of interest because insurance companies only exist and make money if they deny a certain amount of claims. And so they have to deny in order to continue existing. And so they will always look for whatever means they can get to kind of get out of coverage. And I'm not saying that they're doing it necessarily in bad faith, but that's their business model. They have to deny a certain amount of claims. And so how they categorize the loss, whether it's under the initial insuring agreement, so whether they're categorizing it as a volcanic eruption or an earthquake, or how they categorize the applicability of exclusions will be where much of the kind of dispute is. So after um, the kind of initial insuring agreement uh, language on the next slide, you'll see that there's also exceptions within the insuring agreement that you need to pay attention to. So for example, um, the policies will often say the coverage does not apply to land, including land on which the dwelling is located. So the structure may be covered, but they could take the position that if the entire yard, you know, with the exception of trees or bushes gets damaged, that that's not coverage. Or if the value in the property decreases, that it's really a decrease in the value of the land, not just the structure. So again, it's all about kind of how you're going to construe these provisions and whether or not they're applicable. Um, you'll also see there that there's the kind of exception that says the policy only applies to loss, which occurs during the policy period. So that's why you want to make sure you have the uh, current policy just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and um, you know you don't want the insurance company just kind of rely on something simple like that to get out of hey, um, Tristan, uh, Tristan and Robert if you know um, I know you know I, I practice in California uh, and we have a uh, we have a, actually a code section that um, that says that, that um, the where the insured makes a written request, the insurance company must provide a full, complete, and current copy of the policy uh, to them within 30 days, which is ridiculous. Like, they shouldn't need that long. But anyway, in, uh, on Hawaii, have you, do you ever have trouble getting the carriers to provide a complete, current copy? Any practice tips you have for folks on that, getting their hands on the operative policy? Uh, I can so, speak to you. you want. You can go ahead, Robert. Yeah. Uh, okay. So under the producer code, the 448, under the uh, insurance, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for, uh, 431, HRS 431, section on producers states that that a producer must produce one requested from the policyholder or its or its agent a uh, policy within uh, 14 days. And the producer must have it on file, but can have it if it's electronically available within one day. So hmm. we have had the, oh, we didn't know you asked for it. And I've had policyholders that say, I keep asking, we're not sending. I said, did you send them an email? And who do you send it to? The producer, the agent. Don't try and send it to a state farm in Nebraska or wherever their head address is. It's who sold you the policy. That's who gets the notice. That's the producer, your agent. That's who gets the written notice. So we always make sure that the very first thing we do, once we're signed up, we send them the notice that we're involved. And in that notice, we say, we want the certified copy. Very important that you do that because sometimes uh, these agents get, they'll say, well, I'm just gonna send you the renewal. And I said, no, I'll just send you a complaint right to the insurance commissioner. Goes, what do you mean? You can't do that? I says, yes, I can. Yeah, I want the certified copy. I don't want the kind of copy. And the only reason I'm saying that is, <clears throat> where Tristan was just showing you on those forms, if you look for those endorsements, which changes the policy, they're listed on that declarations page. If, when that policy comes in, we have a person here in the office and they actually look at every form and check it off because we have been shorted forms before. And you think you're getting the whole thing, but if you don't check off those endorsements, 
you may be being slipped, uh, you know, a, a partial palsy. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, but yes, it's the one day and 14 day. One day electronically, 14 physical. Great. Four, 14 working days. So what I, what I would add to that is, that's one of the, you know, one of the tools in the toolkit is, is what Amy showed was the complaint to the commissioner. Um, also under chapter 431, they do have to respond in writing to tenders or communications from the insured within 15 business days. So if they're not timely responding, that's another basis for a complaint. If they don't provide the policy, that's another basis for a complaint. And my understanding is if they get a complaint, the insurance uh, commissioner has to do an investigation and it can, in some cases, threaten their license. And so it can kind of get them to get on the ball if they are playing, you know, the delay game or just shuffling papers around and saying, oh, I thought this office was sending it to you. And I think what I would follow up with is, unfortunately, uh, I do have problems all the time getting policies from the insurance company. They will try to send form policies and say, oh, yeah, this is the exact same as your client had. Uh, just look at this one. So, unfortunately, again, I'm not saying that insurance companies are acting in bad faith, but it can be a struggle to get what you need to get, and you do have to be persistent. And you also have to keep in mind, I imagine that they're a lot less forthcoming with the you know, individual insureds than with an attorney. So kind of yes. keep that in mind as you're trying to guide the client, because they may not be getting a response, and one follow-up letter for an attorney you know, may do the trick, but it's just an unfortunate reality that they're not always forthcoming with the information. Yes, and in fact, um, we've had situations, of course, um, where the prior, ver the policy that the, that the person had that applies to the loss may have had actually better coverage than, than, a, than a more recent version um, that got, you know, put uh, subsequent. So it is important to get that policy that was in force at the time of the loss. Because it, it, you know, that that should be what governs, not uh, not some other, you know, later version. Amy, just an That's a great. Point. I think that's one of the things too when you're doing the analysis. I mean, if someone says I only have this policy and it's not the current one, I mean, you may want to look at it and say, you know, give the analysis or, or read through it. But you have to get the current one because it could absolutely change and. Uh, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's just it would not good practice whatsoever to rely on a not current policy, and I, I, we would just never do that, you know, in our analysis. Tristan, yeah. um, hey, Amy, I do have a question um, from um, one of the attendees: Is if don't most don't most insurance companies now have websites where you can download your own your policy? A lot of them do. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, we are uh, United Policyholders has got one of our. Um, roadmap to recovery operations uh, going in um, north of, of San Francisco where all the wildfires were last year and I would say at least three-quarters of the people are uh, have access to a dashboard where they can they can uh, see some of the documents but again it varies by company uh, but that is kind of the modern trend and I think it varies by, by the insurance company, but it also varies by the sophistication of the client. I mean, some people don't even have internet access, and so if you tell them to look online, they're just going to look at you kind of right. strange. But I think the other tool that you have is the agent. I mean, lots of times the agents will want to be their advocate because the agent is kind of separate from the claims department, so the agent doesn't really care. They sold their policy. They kind of you know are willing to help out. Um, so you want to encourage them to be in contact with them to the extent they can't you know, obtain these kind of things on their own. Yes. But I will, I will say this, that there is no situation where this firm of ours will not immediately send out a written request for the certified copy. Now, what we do beyond that is one other thing, but we will, because I never want to be on a stand saying, sir, where did you get this policy? Well, I went to a website. I mean, I can imagine what that disposition would look like. Yes. Yeah. Right, so, well, okay. So we Let's get back to you here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So this this particular slide here, just I pulled out some some conditions uh, that are in the policy. This particular policy. Um, one of the things that you'll want to definitely keep in keep in mind is if the client hasn't tendered it tendered the claim to their insurance company. You want to initiate that process. There's always the possibility that the insurer will say, "Oh, well, you didn't inform me promptly." 
that you have this claim, et cetera. So you want to, that's one of the conditions listed in this number four, give prompt notice to us. Um, also on B, you'll see there to protect the property from further damage. That's what Robert was talking about, mitigating the loss, et cetera. And then number 25 is one in this particular policy um, pertaining to volcanic eruptions and kind of condensing multiple eruptions or events into one volcanic eruption. And that may have implications for the limits or things of that nature um, that you'll just want to keep in mind when you're looking through the condition. Yeah, well, certainly the, the um, there's been a lot, right, of eruptions um, in the last month, right? There's been ones. Um, yeah, it's been ongoing, is my understanding. And then you get to the exclusions. Um, so these limit the coverage, as Robert said, and as we say, the insurance company give it, the insurance company take it away. Um, so this will narrow the coverage and this will be in a separate part of the policy. And what you want to do really when you're kind of doing this initial analysis, just think about the facts. So it's, like I said, it's really all about categorizing the loss. So you really have to look at each situation. I mean, there could be an event where, um, you know, the, a volcanic eruption ruptures a water main and that floods a house. So how can you categorize that into coverage will be what you're thinking. And the insurance companies will be thinking, how can I categorize that into an exclusion? <clears throat> um, also, like Robert said, there's, there is ensuing loss coverage. So even if you have an event that's excluded, uh, that could ultimately be covered if it leaves, leads to a covered peril. So again, just keep in mind the facts as you're going through the exclusions and the exceptions and the ensuing loss provisions. On the next slide, this is a, just an example of some of the exclusions you may see. Number two there uh, is the big one again, earth movement. And it's really, again, just a categorization game. So these are some examples that you'll see. Um, and it'll also depend on where you are in the process. If the insurance company is given a denial, then you'll really know what their position is. And that's kind of helpful because then you can start thinking about how you can get around that. But as far as initially consulting with the client, uh, I kind of tend to shy away from saying this is covered or this isn't covered and just say, okay, here's what the policy says and here's the position that we're gonna take uh, because they may come up with something completely out of right field that you didn't really anticipate um, because again, that's what, they're, that's what they're always trying to do. And so, um, so Tristan, even though the um, exclusion number two here doesn't say the word lava, um, or I, I'm predicting like an insurer could say, well, lava is earth movement um, occurring during a volcanic eruption, therefore not covered. Is that is that right? Even though it doesn't say lava is excluded? So I imagine they'll try to say something like that. They'll say the lava emanated from earth movement and therefore is not covered. But of course, you would imagine that the, the most likely loss from lava would be fire or something burning down. And so the ensuing loss provision kind of brings that back into coverage. Um, but the fact that they don't say lava in various places that I've seen to me is encouraging because it means that if it's not specifically excluded, then there's a strong argument that it is included. So if you go to the next slide, you know, here's several excerpts from Hawaii law that says the burden of proof on an exclusion is on the insurer. So, you know, C. Brewer right there, whenever the insurer relies on an exclusion, it has the burden of proof. And Hawaii courts construe exclusions narrowly. Um, so when it gets into that area where they haven't specifically excluded something or left it kind of open to reasonable interpretation, or if it's somewhat ambiguous, then likely those exclusions will be construed against them. And so the fact that the law is not specifically mentioned in exclusion I would find encouraging, but you would also have to look at the position that the insurance company takes as to why it is excluded and then kind of do that analysis. And so kind of when I'm looking at this and thinking about this case, you know, there's several instances where the categorization really matters. So in Hurricane Katrina, for example, there was a massive fight about whether the damage was caused by the water that was, you know, the storm surge with the water, which was not covered or the wind 
which blew the water in the storm surge and or hit the houses first. And so if it's a water loss, it's not covered. If it's wind, it is covered. And so that's really uh, the key. We actually had a case in Hilo when there was the tsunami in Japan that reached the Big Island and our client had a million dollar plus loss and the insurance company said the tsunami was caused by earth movement and there was an earth movement exclusion that didn't cover tsunami but the policy also covered tidal waves and flood and water damage. So we kind of had to battle it out, but in the end, you know, we prevailed because the court kind of agreed that most people use tidal wave and tsunami interchangeably. And like an average Joe, you know, the person that the kind of reads the policy wouldn't think that, that that would be excluded. So it really is about categorizing and taking the facts and trying to apply them to, to the policy and vice versa. Yeah. So, so like, as you were ready? saying, I mean, it, it looks like the earth movement is going to be the big one here, but it could be, it could be other things. Like I said, if it, if, uh, if a pipe breaks, they may try to get out with water. If they're already raising the pollution exclusion, I mean, that's a possibility too, because that's, that actually hasn't been decided in Hawaii, whether or not pollution is what a reasonable layperson thinks, or if it's kind of the technical term, which is a contaminant or irritant. And so you'll get those cases where the insurance company says, that litter, I had a case where an insurance company said that litter on someone's property, granted in a large amount, but just kind of like trash was pollution. And so they pushed that um, and it didn't get it being resolved by court, but that's the, the that's kind of the approach they'll take. Categorize it as anything that can be excluded. And then you have to kind of come back and say, no, that's not really what a reasonable insured would think. And that's not what's really happening on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I you know, you brought up the wind, water, Katrina battle, and what that a lot of that came down to was what what was the um, law in Louisiana and Mississippi on the on causation and and mm -hmm. what we well what we often talk about proximate proximate cause or efficient cause, and here where you've got I, I'm guessing that you're going to have um, coming out of this this uh, the uh, volcanic explosions. I'm sure you'll have some some new uh, case law coming out because it it's it's this this nexus between the explosion and then the lava. Um, you know, there's the, your courts are going to look at the chain of events that caused the damage, um, and then it'll you know I'm sure there'll be uh, some creative arguments advanced on both sides. Um, you know, because of, of the stakes uh, involved. But again, I, you know, Hawaii case law on causation is going to be important. Right, definitely. Tristan, Amy, Robert, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to interrupt real quick. So this is for everyone on the presentation. I know we had slated just for 11:30, but we're obviously going to go over. Um, so if you want to stay on, and um, we'll provide some Q&A afterwards. Um, but I'll also have this uh, webinar on our website. Um, and if you also have any other questions afterwards, feel free to email me. But we are going to stay on for a little while if that's okay with you guys. Fine with me. Fine with yeah, me. Fine with, fine with me. I only have a few more slides, and I'll try to be a little bit, uh, a little bit faster on this. So we kept interrupting you, so it's not fair. <laughs> good information, though. It's good info to get out there. Yes, it is. Okay, so the endorsements again. This is a uh, this to me. Oh, sorry, on the next slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so on the endorsements, to me, this is kind of a something that you I guess I could just with me. I'm sorry, what? That was, that was a, a listener. That was not us. Oh, okay. So the endorsements are something that I think you really have to pay attention for. Uh, like I said, they're addenda that can show up at the beginning of the policy or at the end of the policy. And they can 100% contradict what you just read through for the first 20 minutes that you're reading the policy. So you absolutely have to look for those. Usually there'll be a schedule that kind of lists all of the endorsements, but it's critical because like I said, there could be something specifically related to lava or earth movement, or if the client purchased additional coverage, there may be something that provides something different than what the kind of standard form policy um, does. So you want to make sure that you touch on those and search for those as you're going through. 
So on the next slide, you can see this is from the declarations page from the initial deck page that we showed. And this kind of lists out some of the parts of the policy. And um, you'll see it would be listed here, the additional endorsements. Um, so you'll definitely want to make sure that you see that. And again, that's another reason why, like Robert said, get the full policy, get it from the you know certified copy, because the form that they send you and say, oh yeah, your policy is just like this. Well, sure, the original part, the initial coverage part may be, but if there's endorsements, we'll absolutely modify it. And that's obviously critical to coverage. Uh, so the next kind of, this isn't really a section, but the next thing that you want to keep in mind as you're going through the policy are the definitions. Uh, as Robert said, they can be in quotation marks, they can be bolded, uh, they can be each letter capitalized, but anytime you see something like that, that means look back to the definitions and find out what exactly that means. Um, again, it can, it can make a difference, uh, can it make a huge difference because something if something isn't defined, like Robert said, there's more wiggle room and possibly an ambiguity, and if something is defined, you know, that can also work to your advantage because if it's defined narrowly enough, then you could say, well, this is, you know, this doesn't fall within that narrow definition. <clears throat> so after you've kind of gone through those things, uh, gone through the policy, I think the next few items that are important to keep in mind are, uh, as Amy first said, an insurance policy is a contract, but it's a kind of special contract because it's not an arm's length deal between two business people, essentially. It's not like, you know, McDonald's and some distributor making a contract. Uh, there's a big public policy reason behind, uh, behind why we want insurance contract to be treated a little bit differently. So some of the principles of policy interpretation that you see here are the insurer has to write a clear policy. Um, ambiguities are construed against the insured and some of the reasons for this that we already mentioned are the insurance company drafts the policies, so they should be construed against them. There's massive unequal bargaining power between the insured and the insurance company, uh, the sophistication of the parties. Insurance itself, there's a strong public policy in favor of having insurance because it's one of our social safety nets. And also, uh, insurance is out there to kind of provide peace of mind, et cetera, and I think the, the courts in Hawaii have recognized that for kind of special interpretive rules, including, you know, emotional distress damages for bad faith because it is kind of a different type of contract. So when you're going through the policy, just you want to keep some of these things in the back of your mind and just be aware of those as you're kind of assessing and discussing how to move forward. Um, on the next slide, it gets into a little bit more detail on the the ambiguity rule against the insurance company. So as, as Amy was kind of discussing, if lava isn't specifically identified, that may make it ambiguous. And if it's ambiguous, it's construed against the drafter in general, but in, it's specifically with insurance policies, it's construed against the insurance company. I think the, the technical definition is if a policy is ambiguous if it's susceptible to more than one reasonable interpretation. So if you have a reasonable interpretation for your client and the insurance company has a reasonable interpretation, tie goes to the insured. And so again, thinking of categorizing the loss or if you're thinking about the definitions, things of that nature, you want to keep that in mind to see if there's a way to, to kind of navigate towards coverage. And then finally, this is, Pretty much in every insurance law case, at some point you'll see that Hawaii courts honor the reasonable expectations of the insured. So that's another kind of tool in the arsenal to just keep in mind if the insurance company is taking some hard position that a tidal wave and a tsunami are completely different, yet you have cases from the Supreme Court of the United States interchangeably, you know, you can definitely make an argument that the policy should be construed in your favor or your client's favor um, because that's what a reasonable kind of average person would would think. And so, again, just to kind of summarize, because this is my last slide, I think a lot of this just depends on where you are in the battle, um, how you can navigate through. And then I think it really is important once you, once you do hit that point where you may have to file a lawsuit or you need um, – you know, 
someone who focuses on this, just you know, recommend to the client to do that because the insurance company have has their own bag of tricks that they just use over and over and over. And so, you know, somebody who focuses on this is kind of knows how to navigate that and you know you want to have the, the best possible outcome for the, the client. So I think that's it for all of us if I think if you want to get any questions or not. Yeah, uh, I know uh, Sergio is our timekeeper and uh, and can see the um, uh, the questions if there are any. So I'm going to um, let's see. Okay. So yeah, I have questions. Just one second before we start with the questions. Um, so just as a disclaimer, so this webinar is not to be construed as legal advice. Um, if you are not an attorney and you do have questions, please seek legal help. Um, so what, I know there's a few questions on the chat. <clears throat> um, and then I'll open it up as well for everyone on, on the line. Okay? Um, I'm going to start with the one on the chat real quick, and then afterwards I'll go to the line. So the one online is, uh, I've heard there's a rumor in Pune that to get the fire coverage before home is overrun by lava, you need proof that it burnt down before it was covered, before it was covered by lava. And people are trying to stay down to film their, to film their home being burnt down. Any thoughts on this? Um, I have a, this is Robert, if I can speak to that. Sure. 2014, I wrote a white paper with the insurance commissioners uh, to him. And a few days later, it came out that approaching fire. And here was my, here's what I said. I said, if I am lava, if I have ah uh -uh coming from flow going toward my property, my house, my structure, and that thing flames on from the heat of that lava prior to the lava touching the house. It is my belief that the coverage exists. It is my belief that the coverage exists. An insurance commissioner wrote that letter, giving that same scenario that that house is covered. I don't need I don't need it to burn down. I just need it to start a fire. I don't need it to burn down, and then the lava overtakes it. I understand it, but that, if that house starts a fire. And the fire department can't put that out. That that house is covered, and that that is my opinion, based upon the 2014 letter that was written. That is also online. Okay. Um. So, so what? I guess what you're saying. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want to uh, endanger your life to get this proof. Um. There are going to be. I don't. I don't think you know Google Earth is going to show the fires in progress. Or the. I mean, there are a lot of cameras. Um, you know, that are trained on the on different parts of the lava flow. I mean, there is, if you can get proof um, of what exactly did happen to your house, that's always the best. But there are forensic experts that can recreate based on evidence um, that they can, once things cool down and they can get back in there. Any thoughts, uh, Tristan? Yeah, I mean, I would uh, I would be cautious about recommending someone to take pictures in an active um, lava flow. Yeah. Just, you know, I don't want to push people to do that. However, having said that, unfortunately, documentation is is critical. So I always encourage people to take as many pictures as you can. You know, keep statements of anything that you're spending. Like if you have to leave, you're going to a hotel, or you need to buy certain supplies or you have like a uh, start thinking as soon as possible on what kind of personal property you have because you want it to be fresh. Documentation is and can be key, but I, you know, it just seems not, I would never want to encourage someone to run towards danger uh, because of an insurance claim. But having said that, it is important to document things. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me add to that. This is Robert again. Let me add to that. That I just walked you through the DP in the HO2 policies. I don't need to be standing there. It's covered anyway. So find out find out if, if you've got the language in it or have somebody look into whether you've got the language. I have somebody sending me a Lloyd's of London policy that's probably half a mile away. They wanted me to look at the language. I don't mind doing that. We do that as we are public advocates. I'm not into this just for money or something like that. So if I said to you, well, do you got a DP policy or do you have an HO2 on your form? They go, yes. I said, what do you, what do you care? I mean, you can't stop the earth from burning your house down if that's going to happen. And if your policy covers it, go to safety. Go get a hotel room. Go get a rent house. That's, that's what we would be saying. 
Okay, everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everyone, and if you don't have a question, please mute yourself. Otherwise, we're gonna hear background information. I are you asking for questions? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Just one second. Let me make sure everyone is. I'm not on the. Oh. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, guys. If you have a question. Okay. Are you taking questions now from the listeners? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so I have a couple questions. I'm here in Pune. I'm an attorney. I live in Pune. And so I've been really interfacing closely with my community because I know a lot of people who are affected or friends of friends. And so I'm encountering a couple issues that I, I didn't hear covered on the presentation, although I lost internet for a while and I couldn't figure out how to get back on. And so anyway, one thing I'm seeing is there's a Lloyds of London exclusion. It's a specific to lava flow and a lot of people that I'm hearing have this and I've seen it. And it says, I quote, in consideration of the premium charges, it is agreed that the peril of lava and or lava flow causing direct or indirect physical damage or loss of use of the property insured is deleted in its entirety from this policy. And I'm hearing from local agents who are I'm getting about to get expect to get denials based on this and I want to know where I send people to now dispute that if there is a if there is a possibility based for dispute based on some of the issues talked about in this presentation um, let me start there and then pass to maybe uh, maybe maybe Tristan um, I would say uh, that so Lloyd's of London is probably selling what's called a non-admitted, they're probably selling that through their non-admitted company, meaning yeah. that the state of Hawaii, right, so the state of Hawaii has not as much authority over their forms as they would over a uh, form that's being sold by a company that is admitted and fully licensed. That said, if the department were to, were to say that, or, or if a lawyer, um, with were to were to challenge it and say that th there is something in white law or public policy that renders that exclusion null and void as against public policy, um, that would be probably the best outcome. But that I I'm sorry to say, um, you know the, that those people are going to have a hard time because this is the way the market's been going is that the traditional insurers that you are familiar with are have been carving out the coverage and then and, and come, come getting out of the area because of the hurricanes and then he's got and then a lot more people are insured with boys I mean I, you know and, and and again their coverage may not be up to snuff for Hawaii but that's going to be a fight am I do, are you with me both Tristan and Robert anything you want to add I'd like to see the rest of that. I got the guy sent me his Lloyd's over there, a uh, policyholder. He says, well, it's cut and dry. Well, there's one thing, sure. <laughs> Nothing's ever cut and dry in his business. You can't send me the one line because I'm looking for the policy. And I will, if it's there, I'll find it. If it's not there, I'll tell you. And I'm not a lawyer, but I live in this. I mean, this is all we do over here. It just happens to be his lot. So can I send folks? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I heard something. I don't know what that was. I, I, I want to know if I can send folks to you. I thought the same thing because I looked at the rest of the policy and I had questions about the potential for there being areas for dispute, ambiguity, and lack of definitions. And so I want to know you. You folks talk about going to an attorney, but I ha you must understand that uh, this area, Pune, is very low income and a lot of people can't afford attorneys there's a lot of people who are just as you know really distraught and i want to be able to send them give them concrete information so can i send them to united policy adjusters the best place to next send them yeah let me just make sure everybody's clear on the three speakers so united policy holders is a non-profit organization so we don't represent individuals uh we won't be their lawyers we will answer general questions and we have lots of detailed guidance. But if somebody wants to take 
their insurance company to the mat and say, we're not going to accept this denial. They do need professional help. So they can either, they can go, uh, uh, now Hawaii public adjusters are, they, that's Robert, they are claim, they are public adjusters, they're claim experts, they're not lawyers, but Robert, of course, works with a lot of lawyers. Then you've got Tristan, who is a lawyer. His firm is one of the few uh, Hawaii-based firms. So, you know, you can, you can always send, I would say, you know, you can always send people to us for general information, but I think, you know, be, people being under the gun the way they are, out of their homes, stressed out, um, I would send them straight to one of these two guys. But again, I, there are other people. This is just the speakers we invited, but these two happen to have a lot of expertise. And, and, okay. And just, I, I run. Okay, okay, just to add, so if there's any attorneys on, on the line that do, um, th that do want to help pro bono, um, you know, more than just what uh, the clinics that we may have planned in the future, um, you can do it through Legal Aid's Partnership and Pro Bono Program. However, clients do need to income qualify, and I know – um, over there in Pune, that it's more likely that they would qualify. Yes. Can I ask two more questions? I'm sorry to hog it, but I just that's okay. That's okay. I, but just before I can, we leave that, just before we leave that, Tristan, does your firm handle cases on contingency where the where the client doesn't have to have to pay up front? I, I know we do occasionally. I mean, we tend to do hourly. The majority of the time, um, but I'd have okay. to ask. You know, we play, yeah, okay, gotcha. That's but another thing too is, if I, can, go ahead. if I can just say two things on that. One, one option is always to go to the lawyer referral service, and I think you can check the box for attorneys that focus on insurance and refer them directly to people to attorneys that do claims. I know that we get uh, insurance clients through that. Um, but another thing too is. When we just had the flooding on the east side over here, maybe like a month or two ago, you know, we got a lot of calls from that. We'll definitely take a look at how to kind of make that initial, you know, reaction analysis as to what, what our thoughts are um, to kind of ah. know if they should pursue it or not. But one other thing that I want to mention too that comes up, especially when you're saying that the Lloyds of London is a non admitted insurer. One question you can ask, and I don't want to sound litigious, um, is to find out if there's anything that the agent said. Because unfortunately, you have agents that promise their clients the world, saying, "Oh yeah, you have full coverage, full hurricane." Then the you know then the event happens. You go back and look at the policy, and you're like, "What? This is the exact opposite of what we told you." And so that's something that you want to look into if it gets to the situation where what I live, you know. A hundred yards from the volcano. You told me I had volcano coverage. Now I made my claim and it was denied. Well, unfortunately, that's a situation where they they have to be looked at. Right. That's a great point. There may be liability on the part of whoever it was that sold them the policy that didn't include the coverage that they obviously should have had. And the only other point I wanted to add is that um, if there are a lot of people that that were insured through Lloyd's and they're all having a similar problem, um, then they can get together. And there are lots of firms that are, that are filing uh, in disasters that file suits on behalf of a group of insureds that are similarly situated, and they will do that on a contingent basis, not an hourly. Again, that that is something that United Policyholders can help with in terms of us being very happy. Um, but there really are only two firms that I know of well um, that serve homeowners and that know insurance. And this is a firm. I like somebody's in the wind. It does. Um, okay. Um, yeah. maybe and I ask you Feel again in Pune in the pouring rain, <laughs> driving very close to the lava flow right now. <laughs> um, can I ask you another question? Um, people are being, they have lava coverage and they have loss of use, but they're being told they're only getting two weeks, even though they have like $15,000. What do they do about that? 
Well, it, again, that's going to depend on that policy language. The two weeks, 14 days, that's a very common. But that's being cut. You know, it, and it's, it's really when did that clock start? When does it end? Did they go back for two days and then go back again? I mean, there's, there, it doesn't say it's a one-time 14-day period. Think about that. Right? Think about that. So they let people go back for two days to do their belongings and then told them to come back out. That's, in my opinion, restarting the clock again, and we've had that work for us. So, and again, we don't mind if you, if you have some of these that want to talk about there's certain individual situations. We're absolutely helpful toward that. That's our advocacy side, just to see. We tend to say, yeah, we're not sure about that. We went bounce off from the attorneys, or we may say, nah, they're just messing with you. We see coverage. Okay, I'm going to send people to you. <laughs> I'm going to send you a lot of people. <laughs> um, Our phone doesn't stop ringing. I understand as of this morning, the count is 80 structural, uh, structurally yeah. damaged houses and about another, about another that same, same as much again on outbuildings, garages, barns, sheds, those kinds. Uh, does that sound accurate? Yes. Yeah. This morning. Yes, but there's like 2,000 people that have been evacuated and the lava is continuing and then there's other evacuees that are voluntary because they can't live in the um, areas that are inundated with SO2. It's unlivable, it's uninhabitable because of the gases, even though there's no lava threatening those areas. Okay, if you are going to sensibly, I mean, I'm a big supporter of, of UP. I'm a, I am work for them. I mean, well, I work with them out here in the Pacific. They do have a great website. I'm going to tell you, it's the best of all policy assistance. So if somebody's got the time for that, we, we won't take any, every call you got, but I'm just saying that UP is the, is the, there for for the policy holders uh, that, you know, from anything, I mean, from the hurricanes to the, the freezing, you know, uh, the winter storm, they, they handle all of that. Very, very well staffed and very careful with that. So, but again, we'll take your call. Okay. See what we can do for these folks. If I may, I have one last question. I counseled some people to get mortgage forbearance. They got mortgage forbearance on their payments for um, three months, but now they're afraid that in, their insurer is going to deny their claim because they're not paying. And I didn't think that had credence, but wanted to follow up here. Mortgage has nothing to do with it. Mortgage has nothing to do with this. What, ha what it has to do with additional living expenses, if they're displaced, that's what matters. Whether my house is mortgaged or not has got nothing to do with how that insurance company is going to pay for my additional living expenses, my, my loss of use of my property. That is not in there. Yeah, I think, I think they're, 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 they're kind of non-payment, but I... I, it, the only thing to check if this is this, I don't know if this is Elizabeth asking the question um, or Laura um, that that the uh, if their insurance is forced place if it's a if it's a lender place policy um, the, and the and the insurance premium was getting paid out of their mortgage impact account it still shouldn't matter that they've got forbearance. Yeah, I, okay, and this is still policies. ALE is not a coverage under forced place policy. Oh. Okay. Thank Amy, you, Amy. Do you want to take one more, and then we'll close at twelve o'clock, and then um. I think that would more? be great. Okay. Uh, it looks like we've got the one that we didn't answer about um about the volcano golf course was evacuated, uh, but they're saying that their carrier is saying evacuation expenses weren't included because it wasn't mandatory. Um, uh, Robert, you want to talk about that? I'm, I haven't heard anything about this. So what was that again? So, so the coverage. Okay, so we always say to people, um, you know, make sure if you have, uh, the, the, you know, if you have expenses from from having evacuated, um, even though your house may be fine. Um, the question here is, can you get coverage for for losses due to the man an evacuation if it wasn't an official evacuation order that made you go but if instead it was just that that you that the air was terrible ash and smoke and i have asthma I, I couldn't stay in the area can you get evacuation from that scenario as opposed to just from uh being forced to leave by the by a government order well you know it's it's civil authority it doesn't even say it has to be an order they can warn you not to go in you could poison it's civil authority it doesn't say 
there's a written hard notice. We're going to shoot you if you're, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really just has civil authority, civil authority. Now, some people said that's gone right down to homeowners associations that they've decided in an area it's unsafe, right? Civil authority starts to take that broad definition, which I think you can use. Huh. Okay. And, and I think, again, you know, common sense uh, still has a lot, of, uh, a lot of place in insurance claim scenarios. You know, if you have a doctor uh, that will back you up and say that you, had, uh, you have a compromised, you know, um, uh, you have compromised breathing or your health is, you know, if you're particularly vulnerable, and you, there's plenty of information out there about the the harmful effects of, of what's in the air right now out there. So if you had to leave your house and it became uninhabitable because of the the, the air quality, even if you if it, if it wasn't a mandatory evacuation, or you can still make that logical argument and say, look, I couldn't stay in my house because it was not safe. Um, you know, again, it's an argument to make, and hopefully, logic will prevail. Not always, but usually. Yeah, and I think you're crazy. So, you have really really the so insurance company. What's that? I'm sorry, I heard. Uh, I was just saying I agree that that would be a tough sell for the insurance company. I mean, it really depends on the facts and the policy, of course. But, I mean, if you're trying to tell someone, if the, if the insurance company is going to make that hard argument that, oh, you didn't get an official evacuation order with sirens blaring, therefore you should have just stayed in your home, but the facts indicate that, you know, there was possible chemicals in the air, they were giving these general warnings that it was a reasonable person would be feel, would feel endangered. That'd be a, diff, a tough sell for the insurance company, I think, to prevail on that. Yeah, I don't, and I think I think all I would do is just get the health department ruling on that. Pull down. Say, were you did you not hand out gas masks to people and filtered mask, and and you're saying use this when you go in, get your stuff, and come back out? I mean, that right there says to me, I'm pretty sure that's the civil authority, the health department. Yeah. Right. Well, listen, this has been great. I want to thank our speakers and thank. Uh, Hawaii Legal Aid for uh, putting together uh, this strong program and the people who called in and, and wrote in. Um, and Sergio, I know we had a question about whether the slides would be available. Um, our organization is more than happy we will, to post these slides. Uh, we will post them in our Hawaii Help Library um, and make them available to the public um, separate from the recording. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you, Tristan and, and Robert, really for your time and just for preparing all this information and just for taking the time to speak with us today. So everyone on the call, um, I'll put these resources on our website as well, and I'll put the links up for um, United Policy Holders um, and um, their, uh, Robert's contact information as well. Um, with that, I, I just want to thank everyone for participating and thank you for um, the Hawaii County Bar Association as well for setting everything up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Good luck. Hello, pray for Puna. <laughs> Will do.